Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I are joined once again by Jim O'Shaughnessy, now CEO of O'Shaughnessy Ventures and founder of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which is now fully owned by Franklin Templeton. We talked to Jim about successful investing in factors and how he is now approaching the venture investing world. He explains why he can take a longer view with most with his venture investments and what he looks for in the companies he's backing. Jim is one of the most thoughtful individuals we know, and it's always a learning experience for us when he joins us on the podcast. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this conversation with O'Shaughnessy Ventures' Jim O'Shaughnessy. Hi, Jim. Thank you very much for joining us today. Delighted to be back. I think this is, what, the third time I'm chatting with you guys? I think it might be the second time, but I'm not positive. I I was supposed to be good at counting, you know, being a (laughs) quantinal. One, two, three, a lot. <laughs> well, you know, Jack and I were talking and um, you were one of the very first guests that was gracious enough to come on with us. We were sort of this beginning podcast, not really knowing what we were doing. And and that's just something I think Jack and I will always remember and appreciate. People like you that had pretty large followings that gave us a chance out of the gate. You know, we're still a relatively small podcast, but I don't know, over 250 episodes in, you know, we're committed to it. I think we've delivered a lot of great educational material, largely because of people like you. So really appreciate the time that you've given us in the past and and also the time that you're going to spend with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, if you are familiar with that uh, stat about podcasts, right, like uh, you're in the upper 1% if you make it past 20 episodes. So you you guys are at the tippy top of the podcast uh, empire there. So keep thinking that way. As you guys know over there, podcasting takes a lot of work. It's not easy, but I think the long-term benefits of it are it's like the the compounding effect of of getting a following, getting good episodes out, producing good material. And so it all sort of builds on each other for sure. Totally agree. I think that uh, podcasts are the, just the beginning innings of their growth curve. Everyone says, oh, you got another podcast. But I, I think that they can build up a fantastic body of knowledge that, you know, you could repurpose into a course, uh, lots of things. And when you just look at the downloads, especially among younger people, they t- like they're they're not listening to music for the most part. They're listening to uh podcast. They're listening to you guys. So you guys are the new rock stars. It's funny, without even knowing it, you were probably our biggest source of new guests at the beginning because you were kind enough to come on when we really had no listeners, we had no downloads. And, you know, the biggest thing you need at that point is you need when guests want to come on your podcast, the first thing they look at is who are the other guests? And so the fact that we took, without telling you this, we took advantage of that in every way possible. We we're like, come on the podcast that had the great Jim O'Shaughnessy. <laughs> and and like, you know, we're doing everything in our power <laughs> to, uh, to use that to our advantage. It helped us a lot, like at the beginning. Uh, well, as my entire family and wife always remind me, I am a legend only in my own mind. <laughs> well, and a lot's changed for you over the last three years since we've had you on. I mean, um, you know, Shaughnessy Asset Management has kind of become part of a larger organization now. Um, you guys have got involved in different businesses, different passions, different initiatives. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of those things today, but I would be remiss if I at least didn't start out of the gate in the first few minutes here, sort of going back to the the old days of the the quant investor, Jim O'Shaughnessy, which is uh is is certainly had a big influence on what we do here at Validia with a lot of the models we run and sort of the way that we look at running money and managing models. And just, you know, where we, I guess we wanted to start is is when you think about your career, um in investing and building O'Shaughnessy Asset Management over the multiple years you did and running quantitative, fundamentally based models, you know, what do you think was the biggest lessons you could draw from building that business? Oh, wow. Um, so let's, let's first look at the lessons maybe for potential investors who are listening, uh, because I think the lessons uh, of building the firm also are good for investors. And that is, you're probably going to always do better 
if you have a process that you follow. It doesn't have to necessarily be a quant process, but if you have a process that you as an investor are comfortable with, you are going to have much better results over time because if it if it's something you're not totally bought into, whenever it's not working, your the urge to throw in the towel is going to be pretty enormous. Um, and so I think that just letting the process work through market and very very different market environments was one of our better lessons. I, I think people ask me like, what are you most proud of? Uh, during your career as a public equity quant. And, and I think it's that I never overrode a model emotionally. Uh, during the great financial crisis of 08, uh, afterwards, in the aftermath, we had a, an analyst who covered quants uh, for what became Barclays. And he came out to visit us and he dropped, I, I don't know the exact number, but it was something like 62% of pure quants like we were overrode their models during the crisis. And to me, that is the ultimate sin of being a quant. Now, you should always try to improve your models or your process if you're not entirely a quant, and you should be researching endlessly to make them better. But to emotionally override a process that is algorithmically driven, uh, you essentially negate all of your previous track record because the track record was predicated on the fact that you had acknowledged, look, there's going to be drawdowns. There's going to be times when this particular model doesn't work. I mean, witness all the poor deep value guys um, and how hard it is to stick with that particular strategy. Now we're multi-strat or we're multi-strat, OSAM still is. Um, but so a process that you believe in, that you believe that you can improve, but more importantly, one that you can stick with. Because I think that generally speaking, another lesson is, you, you know, only, only liars sell at the absolute top or buy at the absolute bottom. Um, and knowing that the odds are so incredibly stacked against you in that uh, arena, but are so incredibly stacked in your favor in a longer term horizon. Uh, that's another thing that uh, I think that we had some pretty good success getting people to understand and uh, st stick with. So, uh, you know, process continual persistence against that process, continual trying to improve it, but you've got to learn how to uh, get your emotions to calm down. Because generally speaking, it's, you know, I always joke, fear, greed, hope, and ignorance are the four horsemen of the investment apocalypse. And fear, greed, and hope have wiped out more asset value, I think, than any bear market, for sure. I was reading an article earlier today, actually, it was from the guys over at uh, Verdad, which is Dan Rasmussen's firm. And um, I love Dan. They, yeah, Dan, they're great. Dan is my favorite because he looks like a Boy Scout and yet he is a bomb thrower par excellence. Absolutely. Dan, Dan if you're watching this, the invitation's uh, open to come on excess returns. Uh, we've had some of his colleagues on. But uh, anyway, so they were writing about... Um, one of the points they made was that there's now more indices out there than there are stocks. Now, not all of those indices are actual investment products, but many of them are, and a lot of them are factor-based approaches. So the factor-based investing landscape has obviously gained in popularity significantly, you know, over the past, let's say, two decades. Um, you know, you wrote What Works on Wall Street, I think in the mid to late 90s, correct me if I'm or wrong on those dates, but right. obviously it's, you know, factor investing has significantly gained in popularity and become productized over that period of time. Do, do you, what is your general outlook on factor-based investing going forward, given how much assets are invested in these factor-based strategies? And so I think, you know, let's use the, let's use a factor-based strategy called the S&P 500. Uh, it has a single factor, which is market cap. 
uh, and it buys, uh, it allocates the most money to the biggest market cap and it allocates the least money to the lowest market cap that's comprised in the index. But the index itself is also selected by a committee. So it's, it's a strategy, right? Um, and gee, there's a lot of money in the S and P 500 and it doesn't seem to have made the S and P 500 stop working. And, and so I think that essentially with factor-based strategies, they're very different than mathematical anomalies. So for example, an arbitrage mathematical anomaly, if you make it public, it goes away because it's math. And when other people know about it and start exploiting it, it essentially arms it down to a zero return. I think factor-based strategies are far more an arbitrage on human nature. Um, and what they allow is you can scream from the rooftops, right? This particular strategy worked over the last 85 years, you know, 80% of all rolling five-year periods. Um, and what, what people don't hear is 20% of the time, it didn't work over those rolling five-year periods. And the challenge is we live in a temporal world. And five years, can you imagine five years sticking with a strategy that has in each of those five years consistently underperformed? Very, very difficult. So I think that since ours is more of a uh, an arb on our very decision-making uh, approach that, that humans take, that factor yeah. uh, portfolios will continue to work over long periods of time. Because essentially, in fact, Dan has a little theory, if I recall it correctly, whereby he, he pours all of his own personal money into whatever strategy he has that's working the worst um, because he believes in the long-term nature of uh, the efficacy of the strategy. And so I think, yeah, they're proliferating. A lot of them, uh, the bone that I would have to pick with factor uh the products that are either in an ETF wrapper or a mutual fund wrapper or a separate account really doesn't matter. Uh, the ones that are designed by marketing people uh, are kind of a no-go zone for me uh, because I think really portfolio managers who've done the research and have a long history of doing that kind of work are better placed to determine, hey, no, this is a real strategy that we have stress tested uh, as much as we possibly can. And the portfolio manager knows all the ins and outs. A lot of times marketers just want to go with, hey, that'll sell. Going back to Justin's initial question about lessons, you know, one of the big lessons I've learned from you, and this is something I would criticize myself for in my career, is your ability to pivot. So if I look both in your factor investing career and you look at price to book, I mean, you were able to say, you know, we've been using this for a really long time, but the data says we shouldn't use it anymore. And then when I look at the business too, when I look at Canvas, I mean, you guys, towards the end of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management before it sold, I mean, you basically created a product that was a pretty significant change for you that ended up being, I think, a lot of the value that you created for that business. So I'm just wondering if you have any advice on that. Like, how have you been able to pivot and be able to willing to change in your career? Uh, that, that's a great question. One of the things that we have found while looking at the softer side of investing is that agility is a really great characteristic for a company or a founder to have uh, because uh, things change and things evolve. Um, the idea of Canvas, for example, I originally had that idea in 1999 and called it Netfolio, but the I had the wrong market. I went B2C as opposed to B2B. Uh, that was my bad. Um, and I think we might've been a little ahead of the tech. In other words, the tech wasn't really there for us to be able to pull off what we were able to pull off with Canvas. But I, I give full credit to my son, Patrick, for revisiting that idea. And he looked at it. He, what's really fascinating is he looked at it from a different uh, uh, window. He looked at He was fascinated by AWS and their service in the cloud and how that came to be. It's like, wow, we have all of this, we have all of this uh, cloud storage. We should make a business out of this. And, and so we had, uh, over the course of about a 15 year period, built out all of the tech specific 
to the way we manage money, but it also was incredibly transferable to the way a registered advisor might manage money. And, and the tech really worked. Um, and things that are very non-trivial, for example, like the ability to tax manage, those took a long time for us to, to get in place, but that was for our own use, right? That was for uh, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. And as Patrick said to me when he was pitching it again, was, you know, Dad, we, we built the Death Star to kill a mouse. Uh, because, you know, we were about $7 billion in assets under management. And the tech behind Canvas could scale uh, to, you know, hundreds of thousands of accounts. And so it's a great example of, you know, the idea and the thought process was there. And we kind of let it marinate. And then the tech got better. And then my son reminded me, <laughs> hey, remember that that polio thing? We can actually do it now. And so I think that the ability to pivot, the ability to embrace a better idea, which I think Canvas is, uh, is kind of really important if you want to succeed in business of any kind. Um, and, and then the price to book that you mentioned Literally, I, I very rarely wrote anything that was a forecast, um, a specific forecast. And the only time that I did was when the numbers were just literally screaming at me. Um, so I wrote in March of 09 a thing called a generational buying opportunity, not because I was this super insightful portfolio manager, but because the numbers were just like, oh, my God, we haven't been in this situation uh, for a very, very long time. Let's look at the other 10 or 50 worst 10-year real rates of return to the market, and then let's see what happened afterwards. And, you know, it's the overcorrection and over uh, overhitting the up target and the bottom target that led to that. So one of the other things that we we were very careful to do was always audit our own way of looking at the world. And price to book was one, as you mentioned, that we had used in the past. But then we got the crisp data uh, that goes back to the uh, mid-1920s. And we found that price to book did very, very low price to book, did very, very poorly during the Depression. Not a big surprise. If the market is giving you a very low price to book, it's also signaling bankruptcy risk. Uh, and saying, you know, you're probably uh, near uh, to getting carried out feet first. But the point is, the, the numbers changed substantially enough so that we got rid of price to book from our value composite and replaced it with something superior. I, I think that kind of research is really the bread and butter of ongoing quantitative managers, right? We're forever trying to uh, continue to verify the veracity of a factor, or as this was the case with price to book, that was a factor that um, was no longer performing over long periods of time the way we expected it to, and and we improved the value composite by replacing it. Yeah, on the on the Canvas point, you know, another thing that struck me is the importance of building a foundation, and you know, this can be a foundation of knowledge, but also like a foundation of you know the products you're building. And I think about like that technology foundation you built you know, not necessarily knowing what, what value it was going to have. You knew the current value, but you probably had no idea that it would end up being in Canvas. And I, I just seem like that's occurred to me in a lot of different like ways in my career that like building that foundation without necessarily knowing what it's going to be for, like eventually pays dividends. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, you, you know, if you if you've got that idea kind of lurking in the back of your mind, it leads to things like when when we were establishing OSAM, it was during the great financial crisis, right? And so I said to my people, look, we're probably not going to sell uh, another long only uh, equity portfolio for a couple of years because people, as you will both recall, were massively freaked out by what was going on. And so I said, okay, well, I've, I'd always had a, I'm, I'm a very early adopter in technology. I love new tech. And so one of the things that I said to my people is, most of the tech that we're using is off the shelf, and it really is not good enough for what we need it to do. And so we started a big, big project 
uh, whereby I wanted to have custom bespoke technology for our way of managing money uh, for everything we did. And that was a long project, but we got it done. And then, of course, you, you get to see, oh, wow, this might be kind of ideal in helping with this idea of custom indexing. I think that, you know, what, uh, what I am very excited by is that the team at OSAM, like, was one of the, the team that was there when I left, uh, probably the best team I've ever worked with uh, over my career. And they accomplished that and they did a fabulous job. And one of the reasons we decided to sell was we really do think of custom indexing as a new asset class category. Uh, maybe not class, but way of approaching uh, investing that has demonstrable advantages over traditional indexing, over direct indexing, which is really only kind of a tax play. Um, this allows you complete flexibility in designing your portfolio. It, by the way, you can use just indexes. Some of our clients do, and they use just indexes, and then they tax manage them. But other clients use very active strategies combined with indexes. So it's been a real uh, hit with investment advisors. And the reason for selling was we wanted it to take over. <laughs> and we were a little shop in Stanford, Connecticut, and Franklin Templeton managed a trillion and a half dollars. When you manage a trillion and a half dollars, you've got a lot of pipelines. And so uh, that was our uh, reasoning because we really thought if this is going to work and this is going to scale, it's going to probably need a much larger organization than, than ours. And that's what we've seen happen. So once you sold the business, I was kind of thinking, you know, what's Jim going to do next? And, you know, I thought about that picture you always put on Twitter of the guy on the sofa. I'm like, is that going to be Jim? Is he just going to kick back? And I'm like, probably not. He's probably going to find something else to do. And you have found something else to do in, in venture capital. So can you just talk a little bit about how you transitioned? You know, how, what gave you the idea to go into venture capital after you sold OSAM? So we had been doing private investing since the early 2000s uh, because essentially when we looked at our assets, uh, our largest asset was 100% correlated to world equities. Um, and obviously that was great for us uh, over time. But as you both know, that's a, uh, a volatile asset and uh, it made sense uh, to be prudent and diversify um, our investments. So we diversified into things like real estate, um, into uh, specialty managers, some of which we still have to this day, but then also into direct private uh, startup uh, company investing. Um, and so it was really kind of just a pivot over to that which we had been doing since the early 2000s and just focusing more on it because <clears throat> I, I really think we're at an inflection point here um, and that, in fact, we have a series on infinite loops called The Great Reshuffle that I've been woefully negligent in, in pushing out in a, any kind of consistent manner. But basically, the thesis is all of the old models are collapsing and the playbooks that used to work aren't working anymore. And a lot of people don't realize that. And there is a huge arbitrage opportunity extant there. And that's kind of what we're doing on our venture capital side. We think that the tools of uh, today and tomorrow are vastly more powerful than anything we've ever had access to in the past as humans. Um, so things like AI, things like uh, a, uh, you know, our exploration of space, we have investments in all of those areas. Um, and, and then opportunities with these new platforms, like in education. So for example, we have a fairly significant position in synthesis school, which came out of the old ad Astra model that Elon Musk set up for his workers, children, um, and is a kind of a revolutionary way to educate kids. And and given the fact that the traditional, talk about old models collapsing, the traditional educational system, at least in this country, 
has frankly just not been doing its job. And uh, there are going to be so many people flocking to these new ways of teaching their kids and learning continuing education for adults. So um, it was a natural extension of things that I was already very interested in. Now, if you throw the other verticals in there, like these are all things I always wanted to do. <laughs> so I always had, I used to, part of one of my hobbies was writing fictional treatments for uh, movies that I would envision. And, you know, I had like 12, I just loved doing it. It was fun. Uh, so it was like, well, uh, why don't we have an infinite media division? Why don't we have an infinite films division? Because the other aspect there is the way that we see the world unfolding. These are all going to be interacting with each other. And the old way of, you know, corporate speak and, you know, passive voice and all of that, it's not going to work in the new world. And you also better have some way to engage the people that you're uh, uh, attempting to uh, do work with or have them buy a movie from you or a product from you. And so the, the, this, this co uh, coalescing of media, communications with uh, other people, with films, reframing what the future could look like, and then investments that align along with those, I think that's going to be kind of the new way companies interact with uh with people i'm curious because you're i know you're a process oriented guy like me how did you think about learning about the vc business i mean i know back in the day with invest like the best you studied great investors you know you talked about i think you were taking computers like to nantucket or something like that in your car or like when, when you were learning that business but how did you think about learning this business i mean did you study the greats did i mean you had some experience doing it on your own so you probably knew some already like how do you think about learning the business here as, as you're starting out in it I, I, you intuitively uh, figured out the path that I started on, and that was whenever I want to learn about something, I just read about all of the people who were massively successful in that particular field. But I also read about the people who were not. Uh, there's some really interesting uh, information you can learn via negativia. And so I, I just, looked at the industry. I looked at how it got started, why it got started. You know, we call what our, our, our venture vertical adventures. And that was one of the original names for venture capital was adventure capital. Uh, the one that I really love though, which I think they came up with in the late fifties, early sixties, they called it liberation capital. And because of the time that that was going on, like nobody started their own company. Like the engineers who started Beerchild uh, Semiconductors, they didn't even think about starting their own company until an investor from New York came along and was like, hey, you know, we'd back you guys if you, uh, if you uh, fled Shockley and, and uh, started your own gig. And so the, the first thing that really gets you uh, uh, interested is, Venture capital as practiced back then, and as we're trying to practice again today, is a relatively new uh, asset class, if you will. Now, of course, there were always the speculations and, you know, you go back to the South Sea Trading Company and the East Indian Company, et cetera. But, but those were more one-offs. There, there wasn't a group of dedicated individuals who were managing money along the lines of these new innovations. Um, and, and now, of course, it's, it's institutionalized to the point where uh, we think that we're going to be able to add a little bit um, in terms of, for example, we don't have limited partners. Uh, so I, I, I don't have to put my fiduciary hat on, so to speak. And say, yeah, no, I'm LPs aren't going to get this investment, or they're going to be unhappy with it, et cetera. So we we have uh, many more degrees of freedom in the way we operate than a traditional venture fund. Secondly, um, because we don't have any LPs, if we gain conviction, we, we can act very, very quickly. And as a matter of fact, I would say of the last five deals that we did over the last, I don't know, eighteen months. Uh, three of those we got simply because we could act quickly. So high conviction allows us to go in early, 
not having to explain what to outside people might look kind of crazy. <laughs> um, you're you're able to make those types of investments, so it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, when you were saying that, I was thinking about time frame too. That must be an, an advantage in not having LPs. Is you know you could really think you know I'm thinking about Brent Bishore and Permanent Capital. I know you're uh, you're an investor as well, but like you could really think at like infinite time frames. You know you don't have to worry about reporting returns back to LPs or anything like that. You you could really do what you think is going to work over really really long periods of time. Totally, and Brent is a great example. Um, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, my son, uh, was is very involved with Brent and Permanent Equity. Uh, O'Shaughnessy Ventures has a fairly large position with Brent. We think he's amazing. And one of the things that uh, makes him amazing, in addition to him being a, a wonderful guy and super smart, is his time frame. Like, literally, that gives him such a huge advantage over people who have to worry about, you know, what, what, what's the life of this fund? Uh, we got to make, we got to deploy all this money if we want, uh, to, uh, you know, draw the fees that, uh, that are the lifeblood of our business. Permanent equity is set up virtually the opposite of that. And, uh, you know, that was Patrick and, and Brent going back and forth, uh, about, you know, because originally when Patrick discovered Brent, he said, Hey, we, and he told me about it. And I'm like, we should give him money. And so Patrick went to Brent and he was like, will you take outside money? And Brent was, no, we don't take outside money. And so it was really a continual dance uh, between Patrick, others, and Brent. Because Patrick said to him, well, under what conditions would you take outside money? And that created this fantastic new way of looking at private equity and changing the name to permanent equity giving him, I think, uh, a real edge in that marketplace. I'm just curious, you know, another unique thing about you is your son and, and you have both started venture capital business, separate venture capital businesses around the same time. And I'm wondering, do you guys like compare notes? Do you learn together? Like, how does that work? Huh. We, uh, we, we, of course, always compare notes and we always talk. Uh, the, the interesting thing here is other than being an investor in uh positive sum and Patrick being on the cap table at O'Shaughnessy Ventures, uh, we, we don't have any joint businesses uh, it, together anymore. Um, and it, it's actually kind of fun because, um, you, you know, when you don't have anything like, well, I wouldn't have done it that way or, you know, uh, I be sure about that. The conversations just get to be much more interesting because our skill sets are very different. Patrick is incredibly gifted at finding people, as he puts it, doing their life's work. Um, and and I think I tend toward the little more out there than Patrick. I'm I'm willing to go a little further out the tail um, than than he. Uh, he used to joke that uh, one time he came came over for dinner and he's like, you know, Dad. It, well, it seems to me like you're the lunatic young VC, and I feel like a private equity guy here. <laughs> and and yet, like they're both, uh, you know, who who knows? We'll, we'll see how it goes. His his methodology is quite sound. I I have a a lot of money invested with him, and and the returns have been great. Ours is really much more exploratory, and frankly, again, now we're back to. The joys of not having LPs. I don't know that I could have uh, attracted LP money, even if I was allowed to, because we intentionally are going for things that we think we, we as a society need. So, for example, um, you know, we have Atmos, which is basically a, a tugboat company in space. Why is that important? Well, because space is becoming important. And is that a long shot investment? Well, of course. Yeah, of course it is. There's lots of single points of failure there and, you know, one bad burr and uh, the satellite goes spinning off into the sun. That's not going to be good for the company. But we, we like to be making investments in things where if they do work, they're, they're going to be they're going to work in a really, really big way. Same kind of thing with foundational uh, AI models and our investment in stability AI.
Jim, how much do you think of this is in your, your lineage and your family history of being entrepreneurial and being businessmen and women? Like I'm thinking back to your grandfather and the energy business. And, you know, it just seems like some, some stuff is just in people's DNA and they're wired to be entrepreneurial and sort of risk takers to some extent. And, you know, other people learn it. I mean, where do you think you fall? If you were to try to break down that on a percentage basis within you, how would you respond to that? I, I think that's a fascinating topic. Um, and I've had really long conversations with friends about it. I, I have one good friend uh, here in New York who's like, Jim, will you please stop telling people to stop being deterministic thinkers? You, you, you don't, you, you don't want probabilistic thinkers working for you because they're going to say, Ooh, the, the odds on that one are really bad. We yeah. we're we're not going to participate with you. Um, I, I think that there is a tendency, uh, you know, the nature versus nurture, right? Um, nature is pretty powerful. And the studies that you look at, uh, show that a lot of the kind of risk seeking attitude is heritable. Now it's heritable, but it also has to be switched on. And, and so one of the things that I think is that there is this huge lopsided, um, distribution of risk, seek risk seeking individuals, i.e. being long ball, right. Um, and risk averse individuals who want a short ball or sell it to me. And when you think about that more abstractly, that's how you get Jeff Bezos. That's how you get Elon Musk. If, if risk seeking was more normally distributed, there would be no Jeff Bezos. There would be no Elon Musk because, you know, 50% of the people would be interested in going long vol and 50% would be interested in going short vol. That market clears. That market becomes very efficient. But I think the distribution is much more like almost 90 to 95% want a short ball, risk averse. 5% want to go long ball, risk seeking. And so it's almost like a stacked deck. If, if, if people were more willing to be risk seeking, the amount of these opportunities and the payoff from these opportunities would be decidingly more muted. And so. Um, you know, obviously I'm not a biologist or a geneticist, but I do understand evolutionary history somewhat, just enough to be dangerous. Um, and you know, that's, a, that's kind of one of the theories about this country, about the United States, right? And there's a book called the hypomanic edge, why, uh, Americans like, uh, a, a lot more risk than others. And basically it, it's thesis is, well, what what were the people that made up America for most of our history? Immigrants, right? And what what is interesting about that kind of person? Well, what kind of person is willing to say, you know what? I'm going to leave the country where my family has been for 500 years. I'm going to leave everything I know. I'm going to leave all of my family members that I can't bring with me. And I'm going to go strike out and and go to America. What kind of person is that? A very risk-seeking person. And then we collected them all in one place and they started marrying each other. And so I think that there's definitely something to be said for America as that experiment in, in hypomania. And, and I definitely think that there is a genetic component, but there's a, you can also learn a lot of these things too. So I don't want anyone listening to think, oh, you know, I, I, I don't think I have the genes for being a risk taker. I don't think that's true at all. I think you can learn like anything. Um, and, you know, the more you learn, the more you might be willing to say, wow, I guess there is a reason that when you take inflation away, uh, $1 invested at T-bills of the mid 1920s is worth about a buck 75 in 2024. That's like no return because nothing ventured, nothing gained. 
I just had one more thing I want to ask you before I hand it back to Justin. I want to ask you a little bit about infinite media and specifically the podcasting business, because, you know, as Justin will tell you, he's about to kill me uh, because of all the various podcasts I want to get involved in and launch. And like, for some reason, I've just become obsessed with this whole thing. You know, I think this is going to be a huge thing and it's something I love doing. So I've, I've been going in all kinds of different directions with it. But how, how do you think about it? I know you have your own podcast as well. How do you think about the podcasting business, you know, as, as you look at it? I, I think it is going to be a massive industry. I think that um, as we build up the back catalog, so to speak, uh, I think of, you know, my son, Patrick, with Invest Like the Best. You, you, if you look at all of his episodes and his guests and everything, is it not easy to see a course in investing emerge from that? Is it not interesting to see that that material can be repurposed into a variety of ways of helping people learn how to become a better investor? And that's true across all categories, right? When you've got, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours on any given topic, the best will kind of rise to the top and emerge. And I, I think they'll get paid. Uh, you know, one of my... Uh, uh, ideas is that teachers are about to become kind of rock stars because back to the educational side of things, uh, there, there are a limited number of really great teachers in the world, really great communicators in the world. And the way that they fit into this ecosystem through podcasts, through YouTube, through Substacks, etc., cetera, you're seeing this emerge and People who are really good at teaching or interviewing, like Patrick with Invest Like the Best, or David Senra with his reading of uh, biographies and autobiographies, like Senra is another great example. That that that's a book, that's a movie, that's a course, and and it's obviously an incredibly popular podcast. So I think that they're going to fit into the ecosystem not just on the entertainment side, but on the truly educational side. And as more and more people become comfortable with this way of learning, throw in an AI agent that trains itself on the way you learn and then feed it all of the uh, courses or podcasts that you're interested in. And it will, it will basically customize itself to you and it, as an agent, will be able to pick and highlight the things from those podcasts, those substacks, those YouTubes uh, that are going to particularly resonate with the way you learn. So I'm incredibly bullish ab about this. The creativity of uh, humans is astounding. And now we have this, this variance amplifier in the internet and AI, which can go through all of the hundreds of millions of uh, data points and and raise those to a salient that might be salient to you. It's, it's going to be a very, very exciting time. And I think you're right on the money. You're trying a bunch of different, sorry, Jeff, uh, Justin, but I think he's, I, I think uh, he's right. I think he's right. Uh, you gotta, you gotta try a bunch of different ones and guess what? A couple of them are, are going to click. Well, to, to your point on David Sandra too, I mean, I'm sure anybody listening to this has heard of him, but if you haven't, like, I would highly recommend you listen to him. Like, if, if I ever want to go just like run through a brick wall to accomplish what I want to accomplish, like, go listen to him. Like, I, I saw you across the room in that New York City event. Um, Like, what was it, last week or the week before? Like, it, it was just an amazing event with him and Patrick. And like, it's just, it's incredibly inspiring to listen to him. Like, if you want to try to, you know, overcome, you know, when you're doing something like this and it's, you know, maybe not producing the money or the success you want, if you want to overcome that, you know, listening to him, is, is he's the guy to listen to. He's, he's, a, he's a hurricane. I love him. And what, the other thing I love about him is he's a maniac. And, and I mean that in a really good way. He, there, the, I've never met a guy. He, he came here and I have a library here. What does he do? I, I know him pretty well. But what does he do instead of, hey, Jim, what's up? What's going on? And he just goes right to the library. And he's like, oh, this one. Can I borrow this one? I haven't seen this one. I just love his passion and his enthusiasm for learning. And then. And then his ability to break it down and make it highly educational. Wow. I mean, and, and David couldn't exist without podcasts or with one to many networks. Um, and, you know, he's got a favorite saying, 
which I like quite a bit, which is you have no idea who is listening. And he has found that some of his stories are just wild, like how he got invited to dinner by Sam Zell. He had no idea that Sam Zell was a cool. fan of his podcast. And, you know, Charlie Munger, same sort of thing. And so all of these unintended, like he didn't know they were listening. He didn't know they were fans. But that kind of compounding, that's really powerful. And he's a great example of somebody who I think, like, if he wanted to be a teacher and monetize that in a very different way, wow, he'd be a rock star. He is a rock star. Just going back to that example of like the custom education thing with AI, I mean, if you think about it, it's like custom indexing. But if there was some type of technology, because we all learn differently and we all digest content differently. I might be listening to a podcast. I might get a quarter of a way through. Somebody might get all the way through. Somebody's going to take different things. But if you had some type of technology that could learn and reinforce learning through the methods that work best for you, whether it's layered over content podcasts or other type of content, then you get like true educational, customized, I guess, strategies is probably the wrong word, but that's kind of what I'm thinking of. The technology exists right now. And uh, it is going to, in my opinion, revolutionize education, not just for children, but for everyone, because you are absolutely right. We all have unique learning styles. And a one size fit, fits all. And, and, and again, here's another theme that I believe deeply is what's happening. We are moving from mass production to mass customization. Everything is going to be bespoke uh, ultimately in terms of education, in terms of a, a variety of these things. And that is going to make the educational experience actually come alive and be super fun because if you could imagine, like maybe you're a, maybe you're not a visual learner. Your average human is a visual learner, uh, but there's a big subsection of humans who are auditory uh, learners. So, in the old days, when you were just designing your educational system to the fat middle of the distribution curve of a normal distribution, it was going to be visual and it was going to be that way. And you know, it's too bad if you're an auditory thing, but the teacher's up there saying, can you see the big picture? And you as an auditory or me as an auditory learner literally can't. We can hear the bell ring. We can hear the clarion call, but we can't see the big picture. And how that ended up kind of like multiplying and turning a whole generation upon generation of people off from education because they just didn't fit. Well, now... The education is going to be fit to you, the individual. And I just think it's going to be a huge unlock in both our ability to learn better, but also to become more creative, to interact with information in ways that work for us, right? You know, everyone uh, uh, has their own kind of vibe and their own kind of way of looking in and learning and doing that. Now that it can be customized down to you as an individual, that is such an unlock that I, I think w w w it's very difficult to imagine all of the benefits that are going to that are going to be derived from that. And by the way, I think to your point earlier, we, we certainly have some catching up to do and a lot of work to do on the educational front. So this is probably a massive opportunity for those companies that can try to exploit this. Um, yeah, speak. Speaking of opportunities, just walk us, one of the questions we had, we just wanted to walk through with you. So you get introduced to someone with a business idea that maybe has a product, maybe they have a business plan. How does this process work? Does it, is there a meeting? Do you review the business plan, review the market opportunity? Is there a due diligence committee? Kind of walk us through the inner, the inner workings of, of, of your process. I know they're all different, but what you guys do at. OSB. Sure, sure. So we're generalists. So we will look at a variety of opportunities. Uh, we have a pretty uh, good team in terms of doing the overall uh, research on does this look like it could become a new thing or a, could this be 
is this an extension of something that's already happening? Is this something brand new that we think might end up becoming a norm? Um, and so a lot of research is expended in just general trends, uh, what's happening in science, what's happening in communication theory, what, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we get a grounding overall in, in the main uh, zeitgeist, if you will, of what's unfolding. Then we have domain expertise um, in a variety of verticals. So we're lucky to have a fairly deep bench of wicked smart uh, tech people, specifically on the uh, artificial intelligence front. Um, so that is a huge network. They don't all work for OSB, by the way. Um, these are colleagues at other funds. These are operators. These are people that I've had the uh, pleasure of meeting uh, who are, you know, the big brains designing this stuff. So the, the, the network becomes crucial. Your network essentially is your filter. I'm stealing that from Don Tapscott, uh, but it's a great quote. Your network is your filter. And if you have a reasonably good size network with super high quality nodes, right? Like genius uh, level people on AI or on education, et cetera. Then when you start seeing the opportunities, and by the way, they call it deal flow. And we see like a lot. Um, generally speaking, people uh, who are starting a new company and want to get outside financing uh, will will do a search for VCs that they think are going to fit with their particular way of looking at, at things. And so a generalist like O'Shaughnessy Ventures ends up getting a lot of decks from founders, um, which in and of itself is a wonderful education, right? So if your network's big enough and all of a sudden you are getting you know, 35 decks on a particular extension uh, that is a layer on top of GPT chat or chat GPT or GPT-4, that informs you that mm, there's a lot of competition in that particular space. And maybe given that power laws uh, dominate uh, most venture investing, Maybe there's so many there that we might want to just take a step back and wait. And But then, you know, our quant understanding informs part of this, too. At the turn of the century, the 20th century, there were like over 200 car makers in America. And now what do we have left? Two? <laughs> I, guess, uh, I guess we could count Tesla as an American car maker. But the point is that that's a normal part of the process in business. Like when there's something new, tons of companies try to take advantage of it. Most fail. And it gets down to the ones that look like they've got a chance. So another thing that we do is sometimes we'll just put a company or a founding uh, a founder or a group of founders on our radar and just watch and see how they do over the span of uh, several months, sometimes even longer, um, and and then decide, yeah, they're probably worth uh, funding or we'll, we'll wait a while. So um, process-oriented to the degree that we want to have a, a general thesis about what we find interesting. And if you go to our website, you'll find things that we think are going to be good unlocks moving forward. We've already talked about a lot of them. Um, and and or uh, we'll find a specialty uh, uh, investor for a category. So we have several of those. We have investments in a thing called the Babo Network, which is in Africa. It's essentially an incubator, an accelerator. We think that Africa has an amazing opportunity over the coming 30, 40 years to really have a lot of economic growth if they can solve some of the um, it, it, it political and other problems there. Young, workforce, educated, et cetera. But we don't have any expertise in Africa other than love going there. Um, so we found on the ground talent and made an investment with them in a similar fashion. 
we have an investment in a venture fund called Anchorless Bangladesh, uh, which is Dan McMurtry, Super Mugatu on Twitter. Uh, and uh, again, love the thesis uh, of this country that is super young, embracing technology for the first time. Uh, we think there's a ton of arbitrage available there. But we are certainly not experts, so we farm that out. And then finally, we have uh, an investment in a thing called Empath Ventures, uh, which is a psychedelic VC. And, you know, reading Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, changed mine and got me very involved in especially the therapeutic nature of psychedelics and specifically the work that's being done at Johns Hopkins and other major universities treating our vets with uh, PTSD. And uh, the results have been almost nothing short of miraculous. Um, and so, again, I have no expertise in psychedelics. And so, but I do have an interest in especially the therapeutic benefits. And so we outsource that to an expert uh a domain expert there as well. So you're telling me that painting behind you isn't a big mushroom? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you it is, it, promoted, it, it is not. I can't really see it. it I'm just joking. Yeah. Uh, well, if you ever stop by, I have uh, some uh, some mushroom imprints in in a bathroom wallpaper. Nice. Like, okay. <laughs> we'll see. Like, what a quiz. Me. Be like Justin. You need to go to the bathroom. Go over there. Tell me what you see on the wallpaper. <laughs> and then poor Justin comes out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cut, comes no, out seeing I mean, different things. Yeah, and <laughs> well, you know, and and that's another jumping off point, right? Like, um, wh when you do the research and you read books like Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, we were lied to. We were actively lied to by the U.S. government back during Nixon's time, and we were told that psychedelics were these things that were going to fry your brain. And back then, I was, I don't know, a teenager. I believed it. I never took a psychedelic because I bought, brought, uh, bought the propaganda that they just fry your brain. And then when you read the history of psychedelics, you see that the, one of the best case uses for them is therapeutics. Things like depression, uh, PTSD, alcoholism, a variety of uh, problems are like, if, if these were standard pharmaceutical things that the pharmaceutical companies could trademark, oh my God, they'd be trillion dollar drugs. And so with that new learning, I'm able to go and, and put a marker down, whereas somebody who's got a bunch of LPs that might have not have read Michael's book and have think still of psychedelics as, you know, hippies wanting to drip, as opposed to therapeutics being used by medical doctors, uh, we're, we're able to take advantage of that. It's funny, just, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, you, the one word that you said helps define successful companies is agility. And I wrote it down and it seems to me like, you know, your ability to be agile is going to be a big benefit for you, the companies that you're invested in, and just driving long-term value. So um, we're certainly going to be super excited to sort of watch the growth of your firm and the successes. And um, thank you so much, Jim, for doing this with us. We, we, we always very much appreciate it. Always fun to chat with you guys. And the only thing I would add to your very nice comment there is you should also watch for the novel mistakes that we make because we will make novel mistakes. And I think that uh, people need to reframe the way they think about mistakes. Mistakes are the single, in my opinion, learning rich environment. That's how you learn, right? You, you learn by screwing up. And if you take the time to not be afraid of making a mistake, right? Or say, ooh, I failed. And instead rather say, oh, look at what I learned. Uh, I think that uh, you, you get better outcomes and it helps you be more agile. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, guys. Really Thanks, Jim. It. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. 
If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.